I think we can go ahead and at least start with kind of introductions as everybody starts trickling in from other presentations. Um, <laughs> and then uh, that way we can also make sure that we have time at the end for additional questions or, or other topics. Um, so we'll go ahead. And so this presentation is going to talk about NI package management, um, some of the past, present, and future. Um, where, why do we have NI package management? Um, what can you do with it today? And, and where are we hoping to take it in the future? Um, and so this presentation, um, we're going to go through some introductions of who are we, and then we'll talk through the role and history of the NI installer technology. What is NI package management? Why, sh why are you using it or when can you use it? And then also what's next with NI package management? And we should have some time at the end for additional questions. So feel free to put questions throughout in the chat. Um, and then if we don't answer them in the presentation, we can try to answer them afterwards as well. So introductions. My name is Nikki Budgel. Um, I am the product planner or product manager of NI package management and license management um, at NI. And I have been at NI for about three years now. Um, I'm Wes Winland. Um, I've been with NI for about 23 years. And uh, I'm currently the uh, R&D tech lead on NI package manager team. And also I've uh, spent some time working on the LiveView uh, legacy installer builder engine as well. My name is Scott Richardson. Uh, been with NI for 27 years. I guess I'm the oldest here. Um, have been with Testan for many years, but in the past uh, four or five years have been working with package management. Uh, I'm currently the engineering manager of the past two years, and I'm taking on the role of product owner for package manager at NI. So thanks for attending. Back to you, Nikki. All right, sounds good. So we will go ahead and start with kind of the role and history of the NI installer technology. And I think real quick, Eric, I see your question about putting questions in the Q&A tab. Yes, we can also do that. And that'll also, I'll be checking both the chat and the Q&A um, for sure, at least at the end of the session. So wherever you put your questions, hopefully we'll be able to find them and, and, and answer those for everybody. All right, I'll start us off. Uh, so before we, we jump right into talk about what is NI Package Manager um, and where we're going, just maybe spend like five minutes uh, talking about kind of how we get here, how we got here, and kind of frame what NI's approach and thinking is on uh, installer frameworks. So I guess one of the first questions, like why does why does NI have its own installer framework on Windows? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that NI software is highly componentized, kind of think Legos. Like LiveView today has over 100 components that, that kind of work together. And, and really not just LiveView, but most NI products and drivers share many components under the hood. Um, and the, really the core of this is that there has never been a native installer framework on Windows that can manage uh, components or dependencies at this huge scale. You know, yeah, M Windows does have the native MSI technology, but it really has no concept of dependencies and, and doesn't just doesn't scale. And there's unfortunately there is no in standard installer framework that could be adopted either. So, next please. So just to kind of give a, again, a concrete that image, this is from today, picture of LabVIEW and DACMX. Uh, each square is actually a, uh, a component, really a package. Can't really see it, but the lines between them are dependencies. Uh, some of those are visible packages. Uh, many, many of those are hidden infrastructure. And then some of, many of those are optional components as well. So you can imagine if you get a system of just LabVIEW and DAC, maybe a couple of their drivers, you could end up with over a thousand packages. So there definitely needs to be something to, to manage this complex system. Next. So uh, back in 2003, um, you know, we didn't have quite as many components as we did in that picture, but really the software had grown such that it became a critical issue that customers couldn't install an IS software effectively. So we created a first installer framework completely from a completely clean slate. There wasn't a lot of Windows open source back then we could leverage, uh, much less Windows package manager. So we created a system, um, a couple of features, you know, had a strict definition of component and dependency relationships between them. 
It's primarily focused on media-based distribution, like media spanning, such as CDs and DVDs. It had a GUI for the normal installer operations and a command line as well. Some build tooling, and then some custom features like EULA's licensing integration and building larger suites and bundles. But as you can see in this, this picture here, it's probably hard to read from there, but the top screenshot is uh, LabVIEW 7. The bottom screenshot is LabVIEW 2018. Not a whole lot changed in those 15 years, but we continue to iterate on that platform. Um, and it was pretty stable. And after a while, once you've seen it, you'd, you'd, you knew what to expect. Next, please. Um, pretty quickly, uh, we had gotten to um, the realizing that, you know, customers, y'all have the same needs that we do. You need to build um, installers as well. So the key point is that when we created LabVIEW Installer Builder, it uses the exact same framework as NI's installers do. In that screenshot there, you can see a deployment installer. That's the same installer uh, technology as uh, the NI installers. So really for almost 15 years, both NI and LabVIEW installers use the same binaries, build tooling, metadata, component definitions, everything. And there's a lot of benefits from this commonality, right? You could imagine that, um, you know, when NI tests our installers, um, that they, you know, if, if, if the NI installer works, the, the installer you built in LabVIEW probably works too. And if like we added some new features for the deployment side, they would get included in the NI side. So there's a lot of benefit of both deployment and NI installers using the same technology under the hood. And we, this was around long enough that we call this the legacy installer technology. So if you see us talk about that in the presentations later on, we're talking about this system that was around for so long. Thanks. All good things must come to an end, apparently. But um, by the end of the 2018, it became really apparent that this legacy framework had was reaching end of life. There's a lot of problems with it, uh, some of which were that it was redesigned in an era of media-based distribution. And it's not really well suited to web first, which everyone really wants. Um, NI software had been a, even larger and, and further componentized. So downloading components only as needed was critical. Like for example, we wanted the ability to add the ability for in a deployment installer that it would just download the missing things instead of including the whole thing all at once. And that just wasn't possible in this old technology. And, it, and this by the same token, it was really not well suited to remote distribution and system management like System Link. A um, couple other things, the industry really was moving towards package managers and standard-based frameworks. And finally, this code base was getting pretty old. It was written in C++ and MFC, and obviously it didn't change very much uh, over the years. So uh, we needed to do, do something. Next. So we needed, we needed a replacement framework. A couple challenges with that. Still, in 2018, there was really no Microsoft or industry standard framework for managing dependencies at really at this scale on Windows. But we've also knew that we've released and you have built 15 years worth of installers that we had to seemingly, seemingly uh, seamlessly interoperate with. We wouldn't want to make it such that you had to just uninstall everything before you could just install anything new. And then we had to solve all the problems from the previous slide. So the conclusion we came up with is that we wanted to really create um, some type of NI package manager capability with custom logic, but using open source industry standards and interfaces where possible. Okay, this leads into my set of slides. So let's introduce a little bit what NI package management is to us and, and, and what, you're, what you're probably familiar with, at least in some form. So as Wes mentioned, after 2018, 2019 came around and we realized that we had to develop this new uh, framework. Uh, it's primarily for package, packet to be able to build packages, distribute them, and also be able to manage NI software on Windows. So the three pieces that we really pulled together that we knew we had to do is clearly there needs to be some sort of UI that you see as a user. Um, and even if you're using the old technology, you now see we call the package manager, uh, at least minimally when you're trying to uh, uninstall your software. So that's the new path we're for people will see the package manager initially. And so it's really to visualize uh, how you install, upgrade, and remove software. It's important for automation as we've, over the years, is becoming more and more important. So we created a NIPKG EXE CLI, and it has all the little capabilities that's available inside of a package manager GUI and more. Uh, thirdly, uh, as Wes mentioned, we know that it's important for our customers to be able to redistribute their applications based on their software they're creating as well as NI as a base for that software. Uh, 
Um, and so we had to also be able to extend this package management capability to important applications like LabVIEW, test and deployment utility, and something new we created called NA Package Builder. I think the important thing to understand is that all NI software since 2019 that's been releasing is now built and deployed using this package management framework. And so one thing that you might not realize is that we knew that it was important to start allowing this new capability without foregoing the old capability and the legacy techno technology. And so all the packages that NI creates uh, internally support both the sort of dual, we call internally dual citizens. They support both the older legacy technology as well as they support the newer technology. Um, and so that's we went through a lot of efforts to make that possible. Next. So a lot of you might be familiar with packages. I thought I might be just go through really quickly and just the high level what a package is and how are they distributed. So packages are really installed software components. Uh, they represent maybe a product, a driver, a library, a utility, or maybe just a low-level infrastructure. That's why when you look at the graph that Wes showed, a lot of those things are not visible to the end user. It's not LabVIEW. It's all the lower underpinnings that make up what LabVIEW supports. NI packages, in the end, have the suffix of NIPKG. Um, they're based on the Debian uh, package format. And if you really think about them, there's two pieces of information there. One is metadata, which is what is the version, display version, dependencies. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And custom actions. Custom actions are also install, repair, and uninstall. All that capability is there. Um, in addition, there, clearly we need to install files um, and the locations where they go. And those locations are based off of system level directories, as well as what we call internally as NIPads, meaning paths that NI is responsible for defining. Uh, where is LabVIEW? Where is Testan? So in some cases, you can reference those paths as well. And some of those things that we're just talking about, all that, those paths that were available to, to target were available in the legacy technology. So we'll continue forwarding that in the future because it's very useful for us as well as end users like you. Dependencies. It's probably the most important construct that makes making well-distributed packages and software such that you can isolate components and their use. So dependencies could be as simple as, hey, I'm installing LabVIEW. Let's also install this runtime. So it depends on it. And must, the runtime must be there if LabVIEW can install. Other simple examples are LabVIEW recommends the database toolkit, but the toolkit is optional to be installed. There are reverse uh, uh, relationships where maybe DAC might supplement LabVIEW. So when you install LabVIEW, hey, DAC, you want to install LabVIEW? So there's lots of different relationships that we uh, export and make uh, useful. Uh, within NI's uh, software that we're building, as well as you can use as an end user of package management. The other concept that's important besides just the low of a package, as these packages build up and there's relations between them, you define them and put them into what we call the feed. Now there's sort of, sort of two terms, there's feed and repository. I think of a feed as being the list of packages and the definition of what's available. The repository is where they're being stored. So my repository could potentially be split between uh, local and remote. Um, so feeds themselves can be defined locally or remote. Locally is an example of having a, a fixed offline installer. So the feed is defined right there on disk. It could be on a network drive. Or in the case of NI.com, our, our online installers point you to, hey, let's go get these, these packages from NI.com. And so they're on a web server. The last thing I was going to mention is that pack, package manager feeds, a uh, package manager has a set of feeds that are defined. So when you launch the GUI for package manager, it looks at this list of feeds and says, what are all the available packages that are available for me to install? As well as it might look through to say, hey, what's already installed? And then it looks at those and compares those. And that's how it displays things in its dialogue accordingly. Next. So I'm going to go through each of those members just in a little more details really quickly, though. What is Package Manager GUI? If you think of many, you know, the important thing that we thought for a Windows case is being able to find our software. So clearly, you can go to NI.com to find our software, download things. Um, but when we first released NI Package Manager, it was important to allow users to browse for products sort of in a store, as we call it, in one of the tabs inside of Package Manager itself. When you install our software, you see this wizard type uh, approach which says, hey, this is what I could install. 
enable what you want installed. Here are some things that are recommended, uh, individual packages, and you can go install those. That wizard approach is applied um, in a uh, common way, whether it's running an offline install or a online install that you download from net.com or even clicking something inside of um, package manager to say install that. It's all the same wizard, same experience. Um, within package manager, of course, as I mentioned, you can list the products that are already installed. You can discover any additional requirements not yet installed related to that product. You can repair, which was added recently in the past year or so. Um, and of course, you can remove the installed products. You have the ability to also see the high-level products or the low-level packages, which might be see every single package that's available. Um, so there's a setting to be able to turn that on and off. Uh, as I mentioned, you have the configured uh, feeds list, and that's also possible to configure that as well. And I jumped over. Ideally, in a package manager, you want to be able to see, hey, are there updates or patches that are available for the products that I already have installed? And there's capability within package manager to, to raise that to your attention. Next. So the CLI, as I mentioned, is low-level capability of managing packages. So same thing, install, update, repair, remove packages. Um, and the key thing to import, uh, to impart here is that you can do them interactively or silently. So those are command line options for either of those. As you can configure the options for the feeds within package manager, you can also register the feeds here as well for the system through the CLI. Perform low-level list operations to find what's available, what's, what's currently installed. You can download packages so that you can operate on them separately. Um, you can create packages through this, or you can unpack them to unpack the, the packages so you can see the contents and maybe repack it again. Um, and lastly, important to package manage is the ability to create, edit feeds, list the contents of feeds that are either local or, or remote. Next. So I mentioned briefly that in the end, what is a package installer? It's just like, it's the wizard you see when you're installing. What does it do? It registers a temporary feed. It prompts the user for what to install and gets some input from the user. It then displays the summary page, kicks off the install, and then potentially unregisters any temporary feeds that it had done. So it's utilizing all the technology of you know, the feed management as well as the installing the packages but gives a nice UI for that installation behavior. Two type installers I alluded to online, which is a small executable you can download, say from NI.com. It has the list and information about the feeds that it might want to connect to on NI.com on the network feeds. And then you choose what you want installed and then it pulls down only the packages that are important to for that installation uh, transaction. Offline installers, well, I'm on a submarine or in a closed network. I need the entire um, full set of feeds of information to be able to install any, all possibilities of anything being installed. Of course, you're off of the network. I need you to install. And those are traditionally um, distributed as ISOs from NI.com. As I mentioned, installers themselves, it's important to support both non-interactive and silent modes. So we have um, command lines for doing those. Non-interactive means it does the install, but you see the GUI being very busy. Um, but silent mode, which means the user just, it's occurring in the background. There's no UI uh, interaction whatsoever. Next. So why use NI package management? Next slide. So. As Wes mentioned, there's a lot of reasons of why we created the old legacy technology, and there's reasons why we're creating new technology. I'm just gonna highlight some of those. So improve componentization of your software. Um, our software gets more and more complex. It's important to be able to uh, be able to easily patch things, uh, to be able to make changes. And so simplifying reuse of your component, your componentized uh, packages is very important. Uh, and then obviously using targeted relations to control installation behaviors. It allows for more complex designs if necessary. More op options for distributing your uh, software. You can use the distribution both externally and internally. Externally might be your software you're giving to, to your th third party. Internally, uh, customers are deploying software to their production machines as well as to the development systems. You have the ability to now publish feeds and packages across the network. You can easily publish updates and patches by using feeds. So I have a feed that's all that has my version 1.0. I can republish or add to that feed a patch 
one or one or more patches for those those items. The end user who has registered to that feed will then see those notifications and have access to those patches to be installed after they have gotten the one product. Or if they stall from scratch from the very beginning, they'll get the patch from the get-go. And there's a lot of options for customization installers that include your and on packages. With this system, with the advent of a product we created called System Link, it allows you to, at an enterprise level, to manage the feeds that are available to client systems. And you can actually push your software um, to systems that are listening in to that system link server. Uh, and you can push that all from the web. Okay, next slide. So an even more important reason is that package manage is replacing our legacy installers. Uh, for the past, I guess, four years or so, we've, we've been planning for this change. Um, but it's important to know that at some at, in, in the near future, we want to remove the legacy support from LabVIEW and we want our customers to adopt package management. Um, package, the package technology offers similar capabilities to the legacy installer installer's capability, uh, but we do know there's some gaps. Um, and so NI, we are gathering feedback from our customers, you, uh, to find out which capabilities are essential for to those workflows that you're currently doing and you expect to be doing in the future. Uh, we know some customers have already fully adopted package management technology and they're running with it. Uh, but we also know there's lots of customers that have not really moved over. They're continuing to use the, in case of lab, using the install menu, installer menu within the, to, for the build specifications instead of really having as much familiarity with the package menu and uh, the build specification capability. So we're asking from, from you sort of going forward in the short term is we like to have you consider start using this package technology for your new projects where you can and give us feedback. Um, but also another possibility is to start consider prototyping porting some of your existing projects to identify gaps and challenges that you might have uh, in some of the systems you're currently working on. Okay, next. All right, I will continue on from here and talk about what's next within a package manager. So let's see here. Sorry, my internet's being slow, so I can't tell if the slide's updated to the next one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about package management technology. As both Scott and Wes commented on uh, in previous slides, we are I think we lost Nikki. Can you hear me, Wes? Um, I can. Okay. So Let's pick up where she left off if she can't connect. Let me present on my laptop. Actually, I don't know if, there it is. Turn this on. Okay, I'm sharing now. Can you see that okay? Yep, gotcha. Great, okay. So I guess I'll pick up where stuff. So as we mentioned, you know, we're trying to identify the gaps in the technology. Um, examples of some of the things that we know that are gaps already is, you know, our built application doesn't necessarily, application meaning uh, the installer doesn't necessarily, con it, it contains NI logos or NI strings. And so there might be a request for the installation of that to not contain that information. Um, package management uh, underlying technology doesn't have a facility to register keys. You know, there are mitigations for it. It's, it's possible for uh, customers to use custom actions to then do some registration of keys, but we want to find out how important it is to have it be more native and then potentially built directly into things like LabVIEW installer builder. Um, the ability to uh, include and register max hardware configurations um, is something that is not uh, native to package management right now, but there are ways to do it for, through custom executes. Um, the ability to, to uh, display a custom readme at the end, 
um, is not built in, but it could also be displayed via custom execute. So we're trying to understand there's a lot of things that are possible with package management, a little more work on the end user perspective, but we want to prioritize what's important for us to start exposing through NIPM directly and through LabVIEW. Um, last one is mentioned she has here, which is having an installed application display a top level ad remove programs. So instead of to remove your software through package manager, you'd actually see an entry within the Windows add remove programs that would be would allow you to facilitate customers going there instead of going through package manager. Just make sure I didn't jump two slides. Okay, I didn't. Um, so obviously we need customer feedback. Um, uh, Nikki has created a survey um, that allows us to get a better feel for what you're currently doing, your familiarity with some of the features. Um, and then to ask you to prioritize some of the features that we know are gaps um, so that we can better understand to get your input. Uh, and there's a little more free form as well on this, this survey. Um, so it's we'll, we'll make that survey available to you so you can start giving us feedback now. From a Linux perspective, um, our the, the package management squad is also looking at how to improve um, installation uh, experience for our customers on Linux. Um, there's different approaches we could take on this. Um, we feel that you know Linux is becoming very important to our customers. Our soft we're starting to support more and more software on Linux, um, and so we want to make sure that we have a good experience coming from a download perspective, but also from an installation perspective. So we're exploring ways to improve that, um, and so the next steps for that is we're going to um, uh, start gathering feedback as we do this stuff internally and start uh, looking at that. Um, and after we do the the general installation process, uh, we cover that. Then we'll also, once LabVIEW needs to start supporting deployment capability on Linux, then we'll start exploring that and how to support that as well. In general though, uh, our current thought is on the process is to stick with core functionality in the distributions uh, based on RPM and uh, uh, Debian on Linux uh, distributions. Not necessarily we're gonna port NIPM over to Linux. We think that's uh, not quite worth the, uh, the the value to the end user, which I think most of our customers want to stay as native as possible on Linux based on uh, the technology that's moving moving there. Hey, Nikki. Hey guys, sorry. Did Fine. not anticipate my internet dropping off right when I needed to present. <laughs> so I'll let you continue on. Do you want to continue on? Yeah, so I think, um, Scott did a great job of just kind of filling in and our, our overall strategy is we want to provide the, the package management experience that coexists with the Linux ecosystem. As Wes kind of mentioned, the reason we have and created the NI package management installer framework on Windows was that there wasn't already an existing one, whereas Linux has package management um, capabilities already built in to the, to the ecosystem. And we don't want to add in additional, um, a new installer framework or a new, um, package management style. Uh, we want to make sure that we're all kind of coexisting with the existing um, Linux ecosystem and making sure that um, we're not trying to force two separate um, package management kind of um, solutions onto, onto the Linux platform. And so that's where um, we'll be trying to leverage as much existing technology as possible as we, we move towards um, looking at the Linux options for package management. I think that's the last slide we have. And I know there are a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Try and scroll down. Also see the chat. A lot of people are saying, hey, I want to include a feedback. We'll definitely get the survey to you. Yes, absolutely. And I guess if there's specific, so we're assuming that if you're putting email in there, that's primarily for the package management server that I mentioned earlier. Obviously, if you have Linux specific feedback, let us know that as well we can get back to you. Okay. So it looks like Wes was going in and starting to answer some of the questions already. So thank you, Wes, for doing that. So I'll try to touch on questions that don't maybe have an answer um, yet. So one of the questions is, how do I see what packages are backwards compatible from my dev system to my production system? 
So should uh, version 21.3 not be backwards compatible to version 21.0 or is the plan latest and greatest? Yeah, I'll, I'm not quite sure I under, fully understand that question. Um, it is that, you know, package manager is gonna show you, um, you know, the uh, package, highest version of the packages that are available, um, you know, strictly speaking, um, you know, the, the newer package is going to upgrade the, the older package. Uh, one complexity is that uh, each package is basically stamped with the version of package manager that built it and is compatible with. And so you do sometimes need to install the, uh, the latest version of package manager to be able to see um, all the available packages and actually be able to install them. Um, any installer though you download from, from NI or that you build with an installer builder will contain embedded the, the package manager necessary to uh, actually, will update the version of package manager necessary to install the packages it contains. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but that's my first stab at it. I think that might be valid also mention that I think when package manager releases, and there are packages that we have created based off of that version and that version of package manager is required to install it that's why in a package installer that latest version is included um, one thing that we have considered uh, trying to separate is such that we could only update the compatibility version of package manager that's required for a package only when necessary but currently the way things are currently architected internally more often than not, we have to increment that compatibility version with every release of NIPM. So that's something that we know is a little bit of a pain point, and that could be related to this notion of a different dev version of NIPM versus what's on production and trying to hand deal with that a little bit. So we do understand that pain point. Okay. Next question. Um, there was a question kind of about some of the differences between NIPM and um, our legacy installation. And so that we kind of touched on a little bit in the presentation and more of those differences are listed in the survey um, to kind of touch on what what can you and can't you do and, and where are the priorities for, for those differences. Um, but the next question we also have is what is the best or recommended way to host company internal mirrors for packages? So it sounds like this question is asking more about maybe mirroring ni.com as a whole. You thinking, Wes? Yeah, it, it could. I, I guess I could think of two different ways to, to do that. Um, uh, one way would be you can, once you, um, you know, have installed packages on a system or you're connected to feeds, there's an NIPKG um, command line flag to basically say download all dependencies. So if like you have like NIDAC, for example, and you want to download all of that, all those dependencies that you could throw up on a feed, um, you could use that uh, NIPKG uh, command line option to download uh, DACMX and it would download all of those and, and you can make a feed out of that. And you could push, put that up on a file server or whatever and, and hand out the, um, the, the feed URL location of that server. I think the second option would be um, a little simpler. Of course, there's potentially some cost with that, but to use NI System Link, I believe System Link has the ability to um, pull down any feed um, from uh, NI.com, pull down all the packages. And if you have the System Link client set up on multiple machines, it can automatically register the feeds on that machine. Um, and then it can even uh, kick off the install as well. So I think using the CLI is the simpler small scale approach using system link would be the way to, to do that from a, a higher level and then allow you to actually push out the those feeds to other machines. So I think those would be the two ways I can think of. Okay. I think the next question I see, are, are packages the way forward to replace the third party activation and licensing as well? Um, will they allow conditional activation of installed libraries? Um, if I understand the question quickly, so kind of the package, the download install kind of portion is, is separate from the activation portion of, of kind of the process. So there are two separate 
steps. Um, and so with the packages, if you're installing um, software that does need to be activated, there will be that additional kind of step where to go through that activation. But this, the package technology isn't defining or changing the way activation is, is, is working. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to do activation. One would be after install. Um, so there could be a post all install command that you maybe prompt the user to initiate activation of something that you just installed uh, for that package. Um, the alternative is when it's first used in some form, you then prompt the user in that case. But Nick is right. There is no facility within NIPM itself to do activation in any form, but there's entry points or ways to facilitate it using it. Um, all right, next question. Will there be a feature to allow multiple packages to point to the same EULA? Um, that's kind of, as we mentioned, the EULAs and readmes are, are one of the gaps that we kind of have identified. And so um, that's not something we have fully kind of set. Um, but if you're, that's good feedback that we'd like to hear kind of what are you guys using and what do you need to make your workflow successful? Um, so we love hearing that. Yeah, something like that as well as, I mean, you can, Scott, does NIPB let you create a EULA package? No, not yet. Okay. But TestDan does, uh, sorry, LiveView does, is that right? Yes, you can check, uh, I think you can import or signify what RTF you want to pull in. Uh, and from there, it can then, it'll create a separate EULA package uh, right then and there with building. So it, it creates a, Along with your normal package you're creating, it creates the sister package along with that, which is the Yule itself. And then there's a linkage between the two. Yeah, I guess just to add, a, so one stop gap could be for someone trying to do that now is that if you basically, uh, you know, uh, use LiveView Installer Builder and built the Yule package, if you then threw that into a feed um, and made it available, um, you potentially then could have that as one of the dependencies you could pick um, to um, include and LiveView Installer Builder. So that might be one possibility. And we've talked about potentially documenting uh, using NIPKG.exe of how to potentially create a, a custom EULA package. Um, that's currently not uh, been defined yet. So that might be an alternate method that might be more low level, but very capable to allow customers to do this. But yeah, to bring it back around, we're kind of stereotyping around like here's some things you can do but yes if if creating um eula packages is something you desire please do let us know on the on the survey for that that's something i think we definitely could make better right. next question is why are we removing the traditional installer and forcing users to nipm um, and i think this kind of goes back to what wes and scott were mentioning um, earlier in the presentation of this is kind of the next step of the technology. We are, and I, it, this is not something we're just pushing onto the customers. NI has already transitioned all of its installers and, and pack over to the new package technology. Um, and so that's, we, we've already made the transition for ourselves. And the next step in that transition is to move customers over also to continue to use the same technology. Um, because at, previously when everybody was on the legacy technology, um, it both NI, um, and customers were using that technology and it created a one kind of ecosystem for, for everybody to use that same uh, installer framework. And now NI is on a separate kind of ecosystem than, than customers when it comes to building and um, installers here. And so the reason we're, we're making that push now for customers as well is so that we can, again, create kind of one ecosystem of the package management technology. Yeah, and I'll just add from a, uh... R&D engineers perspective. Um, behind the scenes, uh, when we, we, uh, Scott mentioned we call it dual citizen, the reason we call that is underneath the hood, we actually have to design, completely design it to work still in the, the legacy system and design it to work in the, the new system. And that double, that double designing is a lot more development and testing, but practically speaking, it also kind of hinders us a bit. It's like, well, the old system is limited and different than the new system. And so there's some things we want to do, but we can't because we, well, we have to be backwards compatible with, with the old system to support everyone well. And that just isn't sustainable um, long-term. And also this kind of 
this works in both system was designed to be a, kind of a transition where they both exist. And then once they we're all in packages, um, we'll once again be back on the same installer technology as, as we were um, before, and we'll get all the benefits from that. So. All right, the next question, um, what would the recommendation be for the LabVIEW VI distribution, NI Package Manager, or VI Package Manager? Um, and so I think someone commented there was a panel discussion earlier today that kind of talks a little bit about how, how, when to use the different package managers that are available because you have NI Package Manager, you have VI Package Manager, and there's also kind of the G Package Manager. Um, and so kind of talking specifically about NI Package Manager and VI Package Manager, um, the way we, we kind of think through this is there are two different types of package managers. There's a system level package manager, which is where you see an I package manager come into play more where it's dealing with drivers and, and pieces of software that you're installing onto the system. And then you'll have like a language specific package manager. And that's where you see VIP PM come in um, and um, distributing like reuse code for LabVIEW. And so both package managers have different purposes there. Um, and there are still, and, and we, as we talked about in the panel, there are still kind of how do we bridge the gap and make in between those two different package managers. Um, but both of those are kind of the way we frame the discussion around those two package managers and how each has their own purpose there. Um, next we have, so, Executables are here to stay, but installers aren't. Um, that's. Um, oh, yeah. go ahead, Wes. I can. I can maybe take that one. So uh, I think what's a little bit confusing is that um, in the the LabVIEW menu, um, when you try and build an installer, one of them is called like installers, and the other one is called packages. Um, that's a little unfortunate. It's really both of those options can build installers. One of the first ones called installer is building the legacy installer with a exa setting at the top, and the package ins the package option can also build an installer with a wizard with an installed exa setting at the top that you can just run. Um, but under the hood is building it using packages, and secondly, it can also build just a package. So there's some some gives you some initial flexibility that you can build a package that just contains your your application and only declares dependencies on the all the ni stuff but not actually include the ni stuff and then you can give that package to someone else they can double click it and it can then download all the ni dependencies or you can put it in system link and build a feed out of it or whatever so both of them build um can build installers just i think the naming adds a little bit of confusion to it so The next question we have is, will it be possible to build a very small web installer that could just set up a custom feed and trigger the installation of my application or framework or package? Um, I can answer that. Um, the, the package manager, the fortunate answer is that the package manager technology would support something like that. Of like, if you see an NI online installer, like, you know, you can download, um, you know, LabVIEW 2021 um, and um, it's only 10 megs, same with DACMX, and then it would just download all the pieces you don't have. Um, I don't know that any of the installer builders will currently support building a, a similar thing. Um, but I think that's something we'd also want to hear feedback on because that's something I think we could we could potentially iterate on as well. I think the closest you could come now would be that um, if you just build a pack a single package um, that declares the dependencies on the NI pieces, and if the if the end user has the package manager installed, they can just double click on that package and it will automatically download all the NI dependencies that are declared. So you can kind of get there, but it's just, it's in two steps right now making sure that the, the end machine has package manager and you build a package that works that way. I think further integrating it such that it would have package manager inside of it be an EXE is something that would be a, a possibility that we could add in the future potentially. Next question we have, is there a way to save a list of necessary packages 
is similar to PIP's requirements file. Uh, I can take a stab at this one as well. I guess a little bit about the, behind the intentions, perhaps such that would it be possible that for my LabVIEW project, could I save all the necessary packages um, that uh, that are needed to make this work, whether it's drivers or whatever, and then once someone else opens that package, um, you know, could it basically download those dependencies or somehow tell me I need them? Um, there is currently not any functionality to do something like that, if I'm interpreting the question properly. Um, but I think that's something that would, again, be interested in hearing about on, on priority. I think we've gotten um, some good feedback on that as well, that something like that would be would be nice to have also. Um, next question, my computer skipping around a little bit, but. Ah, <laughs> I think we lost Nikki again. Um, if I'm going in the same order she is, uh, I believe the next question was, um, what's being done to limit the need to update NI package management so often? Scott, you want to take a, a whack at that one? Yeah, it relates to that previous comment I mentioned before, where currently when packages are built against a later version of package manager, that version of package manager is required to be on the system to install the package. Um, that's not always the case, um, but we're trying, we'd, as a product owner, I know that one of the things we'd like to do is we'd like to disconnect that compatibility version such that a a package released in the future could still be used and installed by an older version of package manager. Um, so that's something that we are aware of as being interest. So um, we do understand that that is a, a, a frustration in some sense, especially when you're working between development and production. For sure. Or even within different developers within your organization. Cool. Uh, the next question is, what is, the what is the expected boundary between VIPM and NIPM? Will NIPM eventually supplant VIPM? I think, Scott, you already gave somewhat of a reply to that one. Yeah, I think we touched upon that, meaning that at this point, we don't have any direct plans to supplant VIPM. They both have distinct, distinct parts in the ecosystem. One, NIPM is focused at the system level, and VIPM is focused on installing things in the LabVIEW specific directories. But the key thing is VIPM can install multiple versions of a package, where NIPM packages are dedicated. There's a single version of that package. It has a dedicated place where those files go, and that's why it's at the system level. Um, so for now, um, that is our plan going forward. Um, uh, yeah, I said we had a panel to talk about this a little bit, so we have more feedback from customers. And you know, VIPM is important to our end users and what its what its capabilities are. And so, we want to continue supporting VIPM. Yeah, and by the way, that panel was uh, I think eleven to twelve uh, Central Standard Time today. If you want to check that out, I think there's a lot of good, good discussion. Just a good discussion on that as well. Nikki, are you back? Yeah. So, why don't you just read the next question, Wes? Yep. Um, yeah. So, uh, can I get offline packages through Package Manager for use on separate disconnected deployment systems? Um, I can answer that one. I think there's there's two two answers on that as well. Um, if you want to have basically you know, get offline packages, um, is that if you're talking about NI software available from NI.com, I think pretty much every uh, software package that was a product you'd probably be interested in. Of drivers, LiveView, Test Stand will offer both an online and an offline installer uh, that you can download. There's usually just two buttons in the NI.com downloads uh, interface. And so the one that's offline installer will truly work in a completely disconnected system. Um, if for whatever reason you don't want to use that or it's not available or you're trying to uh, create, um, uh, you have, you're trying to create some installer on your own, um, I think I mentioned earlier, but there is a uh, NIPKG EXA command line option. You can do NIPKG EXA uh, space help, and there's an option to download all the dependencies of a package. Um, it's something like NIPKG download depths, something like that. 
Um, and that would basically download that package and all its dependencies, and then you could put that into a feed, which you could then put on a file server or whatever. Um, but yeah, just basically downloading the offline installer from now.com is probably the easiest because that's essentially what has been done for it there. Um, the next question is, is there a plan to support web repositories like Artifactory? Um, Scott, I think you replied to that one as well. Yeah, I haven't heard much discussion about that. I'm, I'm aware of that type of capability might be of interest, but we really haven't looked at what type of integration might be there and whether we would, um, you know, uh, support, you know, formally that type of uh, functionality. Yeah, if you have some use cases to share, again, you can um, post in the post in the chat with some contact information. We can follow up with you, or you can reach out to Nikki directly. Um, the next question is, um, is there a way to let the whole installation fail when a custom execute fails? I had the problem that the package manager says that a package is installed even if an error has popped up. Um, let's see. I Well, for most custom, ex for custom executes, um, under the hood anyway, you can say to basically have the custom execute fails, the package fails. Scott, do you happen to know offhand if uh, NIPB exposes the ability to check return code convention? Yeah, it does. But I think what this person is getting at is that you could be halfway through your install. All the, the first half of the package is installed just fine. And the second half of the package is that it got installed, something went wrong. And so it stops there. So the first half is still installed, but the second half is not. Mm -hmm. And based on the current design of how packages work, um, we consider each installation of a package. We, number one, we install packages in reverse order, meaning the lowest dependency all the way up to the highest dependency. Um, so all the low level stuff gets installed, that's successful. We consider that as being a successful transaction. And so we, never, we do not create a rollback, if you will, of everything that was installed during that, in that, in that transaction. So at this point in time, we don't have a rollback capability if you think about from a database perspective as the very end of something finally failed, roll everything back. So that's not currently supported. If that's important, I guess it'd be interesting to understand your use cases, um, maybe fill that out on the survey. Uh, I haven't heard that as a strong need from our customer base to date. Yeah, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that, again, if there's a one, like I want the package to fail, and it's okay that you know the rest of the packages stay installed. There is an option, at least at NIPB, that lets you tie the return code of your executable to mm -hmm. the success or failure of the package. I don't know if LabVIEW Package Builder has that option. Um, if it doesn't, that's something that you want, that let us know. Um, that would be something that would be potentially possible to add as well. And uh, the, the next question, I think the top one on the list here, is um, from Jesper saying that declaring dependencies for non-NI packages is a bit of a struggle. Um, could you elaborate on how to do this? What package, let's see, uh, could you elaborate on how to do this? What package name should I use, et cetera? Um, for non-NI packages. Um, it might be in the, on, the online um, help manual, but I think the general practice from some other package managers as well as ours is, you know, company name dash, whatever your thing is. Uh, so the, the the company name being first allows you to namespace your packages. So that's why you'll find almost all the NI packages start with NI dash. Um, so they're they're namespaced in that way. Um, if if you want a if a package is been to just upgrade the previous version, you would typically you know, not put the version of the package in the package name. If you expect packages to be side by side, then you would typically put the um, version of, like the version in the package name itself, so that you, know, um, you could have package something 1.0 and package something 2.0. If they have different names, they'll install side by side. Um, I think the key thing to note here is I guess, NI packages are not unique or different than non-NI packages. So the your ability to declare dependency on something 
depending on the uh, builder you're using, might depend on whether it's already installed. Um, with nipkg.exe low-level CLI, you can really depend on anything. So in the end, as Wes is saying, if you know the package name and you know the version constraints you are, are applying this uh, dependency on, um, then you should be able to just declare it. Yeah, I think Jesper replied to his own post and saying he was trying to package Python into an NI package. Uh, um, uh, so he's wrapping. Yeah, so that is that's something we that's that's a good point. Like, if there's a, something I want to declare dependency on, that's not an NI package, like Adobe Reader or, or something like that. How do I do that? And um, yeah, typically what you would do is when you you create a package and you would use the custom execute functionality of that package, for example, for Python, you would include Python um, as one of the files in your package payload, and you have a custom execute that would uh, install Python um, silently. I'm sure that I think there's command line options for that. So once that's created in a package and, and put into a local feed, for example, then it would be available to choose as something to depend on um, in your LabVIEW installer builder, for example, or in a package builder. But it's fair to note, and this is a challenge with wrappers, um, that you know, it's creating a wrapper installer for, say, Python would work fine and on install, but technically someone could go underneath the covers and uninstall Python, delete it, uninstall it, um, and the package will still think it's there um, if you had a wrapper on it. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, so I don't know if that's part of the struggle or not, or whether it's just the fact that you have to create a wrapper is the struggle. Yeah, and that's a similar problem to like other package managers you might be familiar with, like Chocolatey. It's the same kind of thing. There's wrappers for all of those, but they're just really wrapping, typically just wrapping the you know the you know, the third party installer, and uh, you're removing those from underneath. Just not a great way to prevent that, but that's a, typically the way that you would do it. You would use the custom execute functionality to call. Um, the third party installer. And once it's there in the NI, NIPM, in, in a package in the NIPM ecosystem, then you could depend on it from anything you want. You could publish it in system link. It could just be installed like a regular package. Yeah. And the payload for Python in that package could be installed to a temporary directory and such that when it's actually installed, then it's called, well, the system will eventually clean it up. It doesn't necessarily have to be a static um, archive, if you will, on your system being installed and the payload. Cool, we got two minutes. Um, let me just take one more uh, question here. Um, can the feed be created to install a specific set of packages, not always the latest package? Um, we have packages that some test benches use, run rev, and others that need to need time to update. Um, I think the question is, is can a feed be created that includes specific versions of packages, not the latest? Um, Scott, do you happen to know if NIPB can do that? Or does it always just take the version installed on the system? Um, it, and a package builder requires the version that's on, installed on the system. That's the way its current capabilities are. Um, I mean, the most control you get over creating a feed would be through nipkg.exe. Um, a lot of the builders will take whatever's on the system or what might be available. And so in some cases, you know, it might take it from what's the available. So there might be a patch that could be installable and it might take that. But I know the package builder itself only pulls from what's uh, currently installed. But it seems like, so I guess we might need a little more information, some of the challenges that you're having there and and what how you're currently doing it so we can understand what tool chain you're using to be able to address, try, you know, trying to uh, address this issue for you. Cool. Well, um, we're about out of time, unfortunately. Um, Nikki, um, is there any uh, parting comments that you'd want to want to share to folks? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Um, first off, apologies for my internet not cooperating with me, um, and thank you, Scott and Wes, for being able to kind of take over and carry on and lead the conversation. Um, also, thank you to everybody who came to the presentation and for all your questions. Um, we really value um, your input and... 
Looks like we lost her again. So we value your input is what she's saying. Uh, we'll get that survey to you. Uh, we'll probably post it on here in some form. Um, I expect we'll do that. And I know specific people I mentioned will send it to you. So we'll make sure that we send uh, the link to you directly as well to make sure that you get it. Yeah, and finally, um, there's a few questions we didn't get to. Um, I'll, uh, we'll make sure we get those replied to as well if we didn't speak to them directly, so. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate y'all and uh, hope to hear from y'all soon. All right, thanks.